So uh, if you have your Bibles, open up to Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. This verse was read for the scripture reading, but we'll read it again, and then we'll pray that the Lord will, will bless us and speak to our hearts. We all need rain. So Zechariah 10, verse 1. The Bible says, Ask of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, dear God, thank you for for having a, for raising up this church here in Pagosa Springs. Thank you for the way you have blessed the beginning of our seminar, our weekend seminar last night. We had many people that were here, and it was very exciting to see. And we also pray that they will come back uh, today at 4 and also 6.30 to learn more from the Bible. And as we focus uh, right now upon the rain, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us. Lord, please help me. Give me the right words to say that all of us will be deeply uh, convicted and impressed with how important the subject is. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, rain. Ask the Lord for rain. Uh, let me just ask you, how important is rain. How important is it? Uh, for this area especially, many areas, you know, if you don't have rain for a long enough time, what happens? You know, things die, right? Uh, plants die, trees die, your garden dies, unless you have another irrigation source. But, and then, of course, when you have, uh, you know, fire season comes, it's much more dangerous especially when you combine wind with a dry terrain, uh, it can be very, very bad. Uh, I have, I've learned, I'm an I'm a avid gardener. I love to garden. Didn't, I didn't grow up gardening, but I've just gotten into this. So in my backyard, I've planted uh, 20 fruit trees. And I've also got four raised beds that I plant kale and tomatoes and different things string beans, and I've got my berries, my strawberries, my raspberries, and my blueberries. And in my stressful life uh, with White Horse Media, a lot of, um, you know, sometimes there's a lot of pressure uh, inside me because of the responsibilities that we have as a ministry. Uh, what I do is I just go out into my garden, and I just relax, and I pray, and I listen to uh, sometimes sermons on my phone, or from uh, listen to the Bible, and it's just very, very peaceful. So I spend a lot of time in my garden, and I've also, uh, I've observed, it's very obvious to me, that if I've got, you know, my plants that are growing, and if I, if I water them on a regular basis with water from the well, which we have a well, uh, they certainly grow, they, definitely they do. But when the rain comes down, I've just, I've, I've observed this, I've seen it with my own eyes, that when the rain comes down, those plants just take off. You know, they just grow a lot better and a lot faster. There's something about rain that comes down from the sky. I don't know if it's the oxygen level or whatever it is that's inside that rain, but it really helps things grow. You know, they just, the plants just come alive. It's good for the plants. And if we think about that in the light of this verse, uh, you know, rain is very beneficial. And as we'll see, this verse is not, although I think there's an application, I think if you're really, you know, in a dry spell, I think it would be good, you know, in Pagosa Springs to pray for literal rain. Yeah. I think this is a good thing to do. But this verse is not primarily talking about physical rain. God is using rain as an illustration 
of the Holy Spirit that he wants to give to us. The Holy Spirit is symbolized in the Bible by rain. A lot of people are afraid of the Holy Spirit. You know, they, they don't want to pray for the Holy Spirit. They don't know what, they think, well, I don't know what the Lord's gonna uh, do with me or, or teach me or convict me of or uh, direct me into if I get really, really earnest about praying for the Holy Spirit. You know, people are kind of standoffish about that because they're, they're just not sure what's gonna happen. But I just wanna stress right now at the beginning of this message that just think of how good rain is for plants and just, just apply that to your life. Rain, spiritual rain, is very good for you, just like a plant. It will help you grow. It will help you thrive. It will help you to become a better person. It will uh, just do all kinds of good things for your life. God doesn't want to do something bad for you. He doesn't want to hurt you. He doesn't want to make your life miserable. He only wants to make you better. He wants to improve your life. Just like plants grow better when the rain comes down. Now, this verse also says, it says, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the, of the latter rain. The time of the latter rain. The Bible talks about the former rain and the latter rain. The, in, the, in the east, uh, in the land of the Bible, what happens is the former rain comes down and it starts the plants to grow. It's kind of the, you know, it gets them going. And then the latter rain uh, brings the plants to, to harvest for the final sickle, the final fruit or the grain or whatever it is. Uh, in, in, the, in the light of Bible history, New Testament history, the former rain fell upon the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down upon the early church. And that's what gave the early church a boost. That's what got it started. And so the Christians went out into the Roman world and planted churches uh, all over the empire. And that's how Christianity got started, with the former reign. And as we get closer to the coming of Jesus when he will return, that's the time of the latter reign. The time of the latter rain is the final time when God is trying to develop a people for a final harvest. Jesus said the harvest is the end of the world. And so as we get closer to the end of the world, we are in the time of the latter rain. And if you look back on the text, what's the first word in your Bible in Zechariah 10 verse one? It's ask, that's right. Ask of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So we, we're in the time of the latter rain. God wants to give the rain. The rain is good, just like the, for the plants, it's good for us, but there's something that we have to do. We have a part to play. And I'll look at another verse in a little while about the same part that we have to play. But there it says that we need to ask. We need to actually, you know, make a decision that we are going to open our mouths and we're gonna pray for rain. We need that, we need to do that. Now let's look at another verse. Uh, Hosea chapter six, verse three. This is another verse about the rain. Hosea 6, verse 3. I think, what do I have here? One, two, three, four. I've got about five verses to go through. We just went through uh, the first one, so this is the second one. Hosea 6, verse 3. The Bible says, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His, his going forth 
is prepared as the morning, and he shall come to us as what? As the rain. Right. He shall come to us as the rain. As the latter and the former rain to the earth. So this verse uh, gives some new insights that we didn't see in Zechariah. Uh, this verse, verse specifically tells us that he comes to us as the rain. And who is he? He is the Lord, right. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. He shall come to us as the rain. So that tells us that when the, when the spiritual rain comes, what, the, what this really means is that, is that God is coming more into your life. See that? He shall come to us as the rain. So it's not just, you know, rain apart from God. It is God. God compares himself to rain. And he wants to come into your life. Uh, and again, just like the plant, when, when God becomes more and more real to us, what happens is we thrive, just like plants. You know, the devil, uh, his, his line is that God and the Bible and the Ten Commandments are really not good for you. You're better off without them. That's the devil's line. That's what he told the angels in heaven. He told the, uh, the angels that if, you, if they just followed him and didn't follow God completely and didn't do what God wanted, and you know, if, they didn't, if they didn't stay on his side but went over to, to the devil's side, that their life would be better. Their life would improve. They would be happier. They would be more fulfilled. They don't need a law. He said, we're angels. We don't need a law. We don't need to submit to the authority of God. And that's how this whole thing got started. It was the devil and his, his ideas were so convincing that a third of the angels decided to believe them. I mean, we're dealing with a mastermind of deception. Satan is very, very smart. He's smarter than we are. He's been around for a long, long time and he, he still palming off the same idea that he did uh, in heaven. He did it to Eve. He said, Eve, if you'll eat this fruit, you'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. You'll be much better off if you eat the fruit. But it, it was a lie. See, Satan's a liar. It's not true. Uh, if we're going to be really fulfilled and happy and thrive and be what we were designed to be, we can't do that without the Lord in our lives. It's just not going to happen. It just doesn't work. Uh, I was just thinking earlier today about, it used to be, and people still do it today, but on their, on their computers, you know, you, you sync things. Like you'll sync your calendar with your, your device or, you know what I mean? You push a button and you, you, things get in sync. So what's on one device gets synced with the other device or the calendar gets updated or, or whatever it is that needs to be updated. Things uh, are in sync. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, that's the way uh, our lives are with God. God wants to get us in sync. He wants to make us work better so that we are happier and we're more fulfilled. And that can only come by following on to know the Lord. It can only come with God coming to us as the rain. It's just not gonna happen any other way. You know, the world's trying to be happy without God and it doesn't work. You know, look at the world. Look at what a mess the world is. Look at the anger and the confusion and the problems, this is all a demonstration to us of what happens to people when people go their own way. It just doesn't work. 
things break down, you know, things uh, start falling apart, and that's what sin does. So rain is a symbol of the Lord, and, and the way God comes to us in this world, the way he comes to us is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is like the rain. The presence of God, the Spirit of God, the power of God, that's what he is inviting us to experience, to have his power coming into us, into our minds and into our hearts, and through the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, next text. John chapter 16, uh, verse 13. Somebody gave me a plaque with this verse on it because they know I like this verse so much. So they actually made a, a little wooden plaque and it was engraved with this verse and it's sitting right on my desk in my office. I love this verse. This verse has meant so much to me and I'll explain a little bit about that shortly. John 16, verse 13. This is what Jesus said. However, when he, the spirit of what? Truth. Of truth, right, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Uh, I became a Christian in 1979. And when I first became a Christian, everything was great. I mean, I really was, I was happy. I, I, prior to that, I had gotten lost, as I mentioned last night, in a life of drugs and alcohol and just wild living. I had no standard. I had no real morality as I was growing up uh, in, in the Hollywood Hills, my parents, my dad is in the carpet business. Um, he made good money. We had a good home with my mom and my dad and my brother and my sister. But there wasn't really uh, very much uh, instruction on morality and on the Ten Commandments. Uh, my parents never told me, just say no to drugs. You know, when you go to high school or college and your friends are wanting you to get involved in drugs or smoke or whatever, uh, my parents never really told me that you need to resist these things. You need to say no to drugs. I didn't even know that. So when I was 14 and I was in the back of a school bus and one of my neighborhood uh, girlfriends or friends uh, offered me a smoking object at the back of the bus when I was 14 years old on the way to uh, Walter Reed Junior High School, I didn't have any real reason not to take it. So I took it, I smoked it, uh, and that was the first time I began smoking marijuana. And I, that led to a habit of me smoking what we call pot every day for about uh, six years. I was doing this, it was hurting my body and I really didn't know it. And I got involved in all kinds of things. But then when I became a Christian in 1979, everything changed. I gave up all that, gave up the wild life, gave my life to God, and things got much better. My grades improved, my friendships with people were different, my relationship with my mother, uh, which I didn't really hardly have a relationship with my mom, uh, improved dramatically when I became a believer. And for the first year, second year, third year, things were going pretty good. I transferred to La Sierra College, I began taking classes for the ministry, I was studying the Bible, had new Christian friends, gave up my past associations, uh, got rid of all my rock and roll albums, and just everything changed. Changed my, um, my clothing. I, didn't, I used to wear these tight black pants and uh, low cut shirts when I'd go to the discos on Friday nights and Saturday nights and dance until three or four in the morning. The only thing good about dancing is it gives you good exercise. <laughs> At least that kind of dancing. Uh, and I got a lot of exercise on the dance floor, which probably helped me survive all the drugs that I was taking. But I got rid of those pants. I got rid of a lot of the clothes I wore. A lot of things changed. Uh, and things were going well for a while. But after maybe 
four years or five years or six years of being a Christian, I started having problems. Uh, the peace that I had when I first became a Christian I went away. And by this time, I was in the seminary now. I went to Andrews University for two years. I had all kinds of classes with a lot of books and, and things that I was studying for the ministry. And uh, I started having problems I I inside. And I don't attribute it to my teachers, really. I had good teachers. But because it was just because there were things inside of me that I just really didn't understand. And, and the bottom line is I didn't understand the depth of the problem of human pride that I was just not aware of. I used to, you know, tell people all about my past and I, had, I used to do this and that and I didn't realize that there was some subtle pride slipping into this, you know, that that now I was this or that as compared to what I used to be. And little by little by little, the, the natural, and now I know, just the natural bent of the human heart toward lifting up self, little by little, uh, lessened my peace with the Lord. And I had no clue what was going on. I just knew that something's not right anymore and I don't, I don't have peace. And, there were, and then it got to the point where I'd read the Bible and I wouldn't be able to understand the Bible. I mean, I would understand it, but it seemed like it was far away, far away. The verses just weren't, you know, sinking in to me. It seemed like a foreign book. And I prayed but it seemed like my prayers didn't go any higher than the, the ceiling in my room. And I just started, things just started getting darker. And um, I didn't know why. And I had a, a roommate in college that he got into uh, psychology and Christian psychology trying to figure out his own life. And through his influence and my friendship with him, I started reading uh, books on psychology, secular psychology, Christian psychology uh, that were supposed to, you know, help me put my life back together and make me feel better. But the reality was they didn't work. I didn't get any better. I didn't have any more peace in my life and the struggle continued. And finally, I left the seminary, and in 1986, I landed just south of San Francisco uh, in a place called um, Pacifica. And it's a small community right on the coast, and I, I uh, moved into an apartment, and I was now a young pastor, still in the ministry, and I had two churches that I was pastoring. One was a Russian church in San Francisco, and one was an English church in uh, Pacifica. And I lived by myself, wasn't married at that, at that point yet. And I was so, I, one night, I, I got on my knees in my, in my apartment. And I turned off all the lights. And I got on my knees to pray. And at that point, I mean, I was, I was on the edge. Uh, the, actually, the apartment that I was in was on the edge of a cliff right next to the Pacific Ocean. And I used to go down the stairs and go down to the, to the sand and I would jog on the sand. So, but not only was my apartment on the edge, but my life was on the edge. Because I, I was getting to the point where I was thinking, how can I be a pastor? How can I be a minister? How can I preach sermons? How can I try to shepherd my flock and be a good influence if I am miserable? If I don't have any peace, if I'm all confused, I've got all these uh, psychology ideas in my head and um, so I got on my knees in desperation and I prayed to the Lord and I said, God, uh, you have to do something. If something doesn't change, I can't keep doing this. I'm gonna leave the ministry. I'm gonna go back to the world, I'm gonna get a job. My dad's in business, he was a, like I said, owned a carpet company and I would do something because I just could, because this, you know, this Christianity thing and reading the Bible and being a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, it just wasn't working and I just, I just can't do it. So I got on my knees in a, in a real hour of desperation. 
And this was a real crisis. And I turned off the lights and I prayed in the dark. And I don't remember exactly what I prayed, but I said something like, you know, God, you have to do something and help me or I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go back to the world. And in that moment, in that dark moment, all of a sudden, this still, small voice, just a very small voice, I could hear it in my head. It wasn't an audible voice, but it was just an impression, this little voice. And the little voice said, it was very distinct, and this is what it said. It said, pray for the spirit of truth to guide you into all truth. Which was a quote from John 16, verse 13, where Jesus said, however, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. And this thought came to me, pray for the spirit of truth. And I, I, I remember kind of stepping back mentally and, and I thought about it and uh, I decided, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll pray for the spirit of truth to guide me into all truth. And another amazing thing happened when I did that. Uh, I had this mental picture in my head of all these little faces looking at me and gritting their teeth and they were looking at me and they were saying, no, don't do that. Just don't do it. And, I, and I, it, was just a, it was just a mental picture and I thought to myself, whoa. You know, these are, these are devils, these are demons, and they do not want me to pray for the spirit of truth to guide me into all truth. They desperately, you know, because you know what? They made a choice a long time ago. That's right, they were right there, and they made the choice, no, we're not gonna do it. We're gonna, we're gonna go away from God. And they wanted me to make the same choice that they made. And I looked at them right in the face and I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And so I started praying. I said, Lord, give me the spirit of truth that, got, that will guide me into all truth. And that was in 1986. You know, this morning... Uh, at the lodge that we're staying at, this morning when I was getting ready for this talk, I prayed for the spirit of truth to guide me into all truth. And how, let's see, I'm not that good at math, but 1986, 2022, how many years is that? How many? 30, 35, 36, let's see, 86, 36. 36 years. So 36 years I have been doing that. I have been praying for the spirit of truth to guide me into all truth. I started that day in the dark in my apartment in Pacifica and I have not stopped doing that. And my life has totally changed. I am not having the battles that I had at that time. My confusion is gone. The Lord has given me so much peace and so much of his love and he's just blessed me. He's blessed White Horse Media, he's blessed my family, now I'm married, I have kids, two beautiful children. Um, you know, life is not always easy. There's, I've had other battles that I've been through in the last so many years, many battles, but I can tell you that my life, this thing is kind of wobbling here. I don't know if I have a little, let's see if I can get this, keep this on here. You get my point? 
uh, everything has changed. What happened when I began to pray for the spirit of truth was the Holy Spirit began to convict me step by step by step that the problem that got me into my crisis was me. I, mean, I don't know if you ever heard this, but the, I saw there was a plaque on somebody's refrigerator and it said, uh, Lord, I found the problem. It's me. <laughs> and then the rest of it says, my child, I have the answer. It's me. Oh, and the, the spirit of truth began to work with me and little by little, it didn't happen overnight and it's still going on, it's not over yet. But little by little, he began to show me in my conscience, he helped me to see where I had made steps in the past that had gotten me into my crisis. He showed me the secret uh, parts of my own pride, the secret parts of self, the things that I had, where I had exalted myself and gotten into different ideas that I shouldn't have gotten into and had uh, friends, friendships that I really shouldn't have had and that I had you know, done this or that and made, made choices that had been bad. Uh, one time in this journey, I remember looking at the Ten Commandments in my mental, in my mind, I saw the Ten Commandments. And when I was a kid, I used to play uh, pinball. We used to go to the arcades and play pinball games on Ventura Boulevard. We used to ride our bikes down and, and uh, you know, you, you, you put in the quarter and you shoot the ball and when the ball, when you flick it and it hits certain things, the little things light up. Bing, it lights up. Bing, it lights up and you get points. And I remember looking at the Ten Commandments after I've been praying for the Holy Spirit and uh, I looked at the first one, you shall have no other gods before me and bing, it lit up that I had broken that commandment. I had had me instead of God as number one. And I had idols in my, in my life, bing, and I went down through them one by one and almost every single one of them lit up. And I, and I realized the Holy Spirit was convicting me of my sins, that I had broken this commandment, this commandment, this commandment, this commandment without even hardly knowing it. And then when I saw that, and I would uh, confess that and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for doing this or this or this. You know, then what happens is when you confess sin, then your, your conscience starts getting cleaner. You start feeling a sense of forgiveness and, and some more stability. And you get more in sync, you know, with truth and with God's commandments and with what's right and what's wrong. And that's what's been going on in my life for 36 years. Praying for the Holy Spirit has done wonders for me. It's just been so good. It's been fantastic. It's just like rain watering your plant in your garden and your plant really starts growing. You know, it's just been fantastic. Uh, the devil says, don't do it. It's going to be bad. It's going to hurt you. You're going to you know, not be you anymore. Uh, you're not going to have a fulfilled life. That's a total lie. It's a total lie. Amen. It's only in following God and following the Holy Spirit and doing what's right. That's where our lives begin to really grow. To really grow. Okay, two more texts. Uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke 11, 13. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, Jesus said, if you then being evil, and that's not very flattering, is it? Is he right? Yes. Now, we're, we're supposed to be saints. You know, here we are, we're, you know, most of us or maybe all of us are Seventh-day Adventists. We try to have a high standard in our life. And yet here Jesus says, if you then being evil, it's not very flattering to pride, but Jesus always speaks the truth, doesn't he? He always speaks the truth. Our, our nature, our bent is in the wrong direction. 
naturally. And he knows that. And we all have that problem. We all of us do. So he said, if you then, being evil, you still know how to give good gifts to your children. So even though we're evil, it doesn't mean that nothing good can come from us because we still know how to take, you know, how to love our kids and how to take care of them. And we still, you know, give good gifts to our children. But he said, if you then, being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And what he's saying is, you know, if you wonder, well, maybe God doesn't really want to give me the Holy Spirit. Maybe I'm too bad. Maybe I've got too many problems. Maybe he just, you know, maybe he just doesn't want me. That's another lie that comes from the devil. The devil has a lot of lies. He's miserable. He's pitiful. And we shouldn't give him the time of day. We should not listen to him. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says that we, as you know, evil or with all the problems that we have, if we still know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more shall your father who is in heaven, who, who is not evil, but who, and who loves you with the love that you'll never understand. He loves you more than we love our kids, or that you love your parents, or you love your wife or your husband. He loves you more than you'll ever know. And he, he is much more willing to give to you the Holy Spirit, it says, to them that ask him. This is the greatest gift we can get down here. The greatest gift of God is Jesus Christ who gave his life on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. And the greatest gift that we can have now is the Holy Spirit that will help us to understand that. Uh, when we have the Holy Spirit in our life, he convicts us of sin. He shows our conscience where we've done things that we shouldn't have done. He takes us back to the past. He shows you things where you've making, making, made wrong steps. One of the big things that the Holy Spirit does is he helps us to understand the Bible. The, you know, sometimes, you know, people think, well, I just, I can hardly understand the Bible. I can't relate to the Bible. It's like a foreign book in a different language. But, you know, that can change. That can change if you start praying for the Holy Spirit. If you start praying for the Holy Spirit every day, day after day, more and more, things will change in your life. Just like plants grow rapidly when the rain comes down. You know, sometimes we get into a rut and the devil tries to convince us that you're in a rut and it's always gonna be this way. You cannot get out of your rut no matter what you do, you've already tried many times, it's not gonna work, you're gonna be there in your rut for the rest of your life, so don't try. Signed, the devil. He's, that's a lie. Amen. That's a lie. Things can change in your life. And the best way for that to happen is to pray for the spirit of truth. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray for the rain to come in to your life. And again, just like in uh, Zechariah, we already read where it says ask. Jesus says the same thing here. It says, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So there we have to do our part. We have to actually make a decision, and we're going to say, we're going we're gonna to make a choice, and I'm not, not asking you to, you know, pray right now in this church, but you can still make a choice in your mind right now that when you get home, and tomorrow, and the next day, you're going to start doing something different that maybe you've never done before. You're going to start praying on a regular basis for the Holy Spirit to come into your life more and more. And I tell you, if you'll do that, it will be very good for you. 
It will not be bad. It won't make you miserable. It won't hurt you. It will only help you. It will make you a better man or a better woman or a better child or a better father or a better wife or a better husband. It'll help you to be more thoughtful of others, how to, be, how to listen more, how to be a better Christian, how to learn to become more unselfish, how to learn to become more like Jesus, to develop a good character and that you'll feel good about so you can go to bed at night and you can sleep better. You'll be able to sleep better. I went through a terrible time about three years ago where I lost my ability to sleep and it actually wasn't because of any secret sin in my life, it was because of other issues in my brain. And I went four days without any sleep. Can you imagine? Four nights, no sleep. And that was a real problem for me. But the Lord solved my problem. He helped me to get things back together and last night I slept just fine. And, uh, but as far as your conscience goes, if you, you know, if you pray for the Holy Spirit and if you start doing more of what's right and resisting the devil, your conscience will be cleaner and you'll sleep better. Amen. You'll sleep better at night. And we all need that. We all need to sleep better. Praying for the Holy Spirit will show you where you're wrong, show you what's right, help you to understand the Bible, give you strength to resist the devil, help you to obey God, and it will also show you more of God's love for you and what Jesus did for you on the cross. It'll become more and more real to you in your life, in your mind, because you're doing that. Okay, last verse. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. This is a wonderful verse. This is the, the goal. It's what God wants to do inside of you if you will pray for the spirit of truth. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray for the rain. Verse 22 says, but the fruit of the spirit. I like fruit. I'm a fruit guy. I've got 20 fruit trees in my backyard and it takes a long time for fruit to grow in, on trees if any of you have any fruit trees. Sometimes my wife said, honey, when are we gonna get fruit from those trees? because they, they take a long time. But this year, I've got a big plum tree that's loaded with flowers. I've got another Santa Rosa plum tree loaded with flowers. I've got a Shiro plum tree loaded with flowers. I've got two frost peach trees loaded with flowers and a um, flaming fury peach tree loaded with flowers and a Bartlett pear tree loaded with flowers. And the flowers are coming. And, and when the flowers start blooming, then the bees come. I love the bees. The bees come and they pollinate the flowers and then eventually the fruit comes. And oh, the fruit is good. And uh, fruit is good. It's good for my body, it's good for everything. And God wants to give you fruit in your life. The fruit, and notice it's the fruit of the Spirit. If this fruit is going to grow in your life, you can't get it without the Holy Spirit. My trees are not going to grow, and I'm not going to get any fruit unless we get <coughs> rain. Got to have the rain. Got to have the water. And that's what leads to the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, which means patience, gentleness, what a wonderful character quality, goodness, faith, meekness instead of pride or selfishness, meekness, temperance, which means self-control. Against such there is no law. 
There's no law of God that is against love and joy and peace. God's law wants to see love and joy and peace in people's life. That's what the law is all about. It's the law of love. God's law is a good law. It's a loving law. It's what's good for everybody. It's what's good for the entire universe. Satan made a big mistake when he rebelled against God's law. He's wrong. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's a disaster. And he's going down because of what he's done. God's commandments, which reflect his character, are good. And following God's commandments, following God, doing what's right is good, and it will result in love and joy and peace. How many of you would like to have more love in your life? How about more joy in your life? How about more peace in your life? How about more gentleness? and a good character, so you'll be easier to get along with. <laughs> more humility, more kindness, more faith, so that when you have problems, you can still trust God and say, Lord, I'm in a big problem right now, but I'm gonna trust you, you're gonna get me through. When I couldn't sleep for four nights in a row, the devil was telling me, just kill yourself, take your life. I've never been suicidal as I was growing up, never, until I went through this period. I had all these thoughts saying, just end your life, end your life. It's, you're not, your life is not worth living. And what, held, what kept me in the midst of all of this was my faith. Yes. I didn't lose my faith. I said, Lord, I'm gonna trust you that you're gonna bring me through this somehow. And I held on. I looked at a picture of my kids and I just thought, I can't kill myself. What would I do to, my, what would I, what would I do to Abby or Seth or Kristen right. if I took my life? I would hurt them so much that dad killed himself. And I said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Lord, I'm going to trust you. You're going to get me through this. And he did. He did. Praise the Lord. Now I'm going to help my, my son go through college. He's leaving to go to college in September. And my daughter, and my wife, by God's grace, my commitment is to be a good husband and a good dad and a good man and to help other people to get ready for heaven yes. and to help them in their lives. And that's what I want this sermon to do for you. And I just want to plead with you, no matter what's going on in your life, make one of the best decisions you can ever make. And that is to pray for the Holy Spirit to guide your life. And he will. And these beautiful fruits will grow in you. Now, it may be kind of a rocky road, you know, to get there. But he'll do it. If you hold on, don't give up. Keep going. Keep praying. Never give up. Never. Get, you ever hear, I think, who was it? Winston Churchill, who gave a, an address to a group of uh, college graduates. And he, he said uh, his, his address was very short. He stood up and he said, never give up. And then he started to sit down. And then he got back up and he said, never give up. And then he, he was old and he went back to sit down and then he stopped and he went back to the pulpit and then he said, never, ever give up. And then he sat down and that was his address. And I tell you, those kids, they never forgot it. <laughs> never forgot it. So I hope you won't forget this either. Never give up. Pray for the Holy Spirit. It's good for you. God will help you in your life. He will help you. He can do it. He's bigger than all your problems. He's bigger than the devil. He's bigger than any trial you'll ever go through. If you just stick with him, he'll stick with you. And he'll bring you through all the way to the end. Okay, let's go back to Zechariah 10.1. We'll read this and we'll pray. Zechariah. 
Zechariah 10, verse 1 says, ask of the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain and the Lord will make bright clouds and he will give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. That's what God wants to do for me, for you, for this church, for our weekend, for our seminar, for your family. He wants it for all of us. So what do we do? Let's pray for rain. Let's uh, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for blessing this talk today. Thank you for bringing me through all the uh, terrible struggles I've been through. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, who has helped me so much and is still guiding me more and more into all truth. And I just pray for everybody here that everybody will hear that still small voice inside their hearts through this message and that they will make a decision like I made in 1986, that they will start praying for the spirit of truth to guide their lives and to help them to get to know you better. Lord, we need the rain. Give us the rain in this time of the latter rain and bring rain, physical rain, to this area as well and spiritual rain into our lives and get us ready for the return of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.